What message can we get from a Charlie Brown Christmas? That's what we'll find out today. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Linus Van Pelt, A Charlie Brown Christmas. I always loved A Charlie Brown Christmas, even though I was an atheist, and I never understood how such a religious message got into a kid's show. Usually kid shows are pretty generic. They don't go deep into religion. They try to be silly, funny, laughing, and having a good time. Think about the Grinch who stole Christmas. Good messages in there, but it doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. So let's first cover what the Charlie Brown Christmas is like. Our opening scene is we see skaters, snowballs, kids eating snowflakes, watching the snow, all those things I love. You got me at winter. I love everything winter. And it's pretty serene. Linus, he doesn't have a care in the world. Even when it challenged about his most favorite blanket, he says he'll make it into a sports coat. Pigpen? The thing that always got me about Pigpen is I sort of felt a little like Pigpen, or at least grew up a little bit like Pigpen, and I worried there was a cloud of dust around me all the time. But you know what it got me about him is he never cared. He never cared what other people thought of him, and I always appreciated that. Maybe he didn't care a little too much, but he was always just Pigpen. He did his own thing. We see Lucy, and she is a little bit different in this one. She's a little bit nicer, actually, than most times we see Lucy. She seems to care what's going on with Charlie Brown, but she is a psychiatrist, according to her, and so she first wants you to pay. Okay, That's pretty funny. But she loves the sound of the coin jingling around in her can. She brings all the modern ideas of psychiatry or psychology to Charlie Brown gives him all the different phobias, and tries to help him identify which phobia he has. And you know what? Charlie Brown's afraid of everything. She does help him. She explains to him that now that he's identified what's gone wrong, now he can be on the path to making it better. And that he should get involved in Christmas instead of being dismayed by Christmas. And I think she has him going on the right path of how to fix what's going on. But her too, she gets all the gifts. She says she gets bikes and toys, but what she really wants is real estate. So even when you get everything that you want, I think you never quite get satisfied. Snoopy, Snoopy never has a care in the world. Isn't that funny? He is always happy. He's always doing everything. He even has a flyer about money, money, money. Join the decorations contest. Charlie Brown laments, even my dog has gone commercial. And we cut to a scene where Snoopy's on top of his house, reading the paper and eating a bunch of treats. Big stack of them. Yeah, don't we do that all? We buy every particular Christmas treat we can think of and sit there and eat it the whole time. Well, I know I did. And damn, boy. So then Sally, we cut to Sally and she wants to write Santa a letter. It's actually a very pleasant letter. It starts out asking Santa how he is and how's his wife. But what does she want? She wants the exact size and colors of all her gifts and many of them. She also says you can send money instead, tens and twenties. And when you look it up on the internet, $20 is $190 in 2023 money. She was looking for big gifts there. So Sally, she's all into the gifts. And getting things. We see Charlie Brown and he's sad about Christmas. He's dismayed. He never got Christmas cards. He wants to know why Christmas is so terrible. Wouldn't it be better if we just didn't even have it? Why have a whole holiday just to celebrate his misery and the fact that nobody likes him? Charlie Brown feels like I think a lot of people when they feel isolated. I always had the thing that I never spend Christmas with people because they're all spending it with their own people. I don't have a family who celebrates Christmas, so I spend it alone. And I think for a long while, as a non-Christian, and then even later as a Christian, I felt a little sad that I was always by myself and didn't have anyone to spend Christmas with. But I understood, at least, 
that Christmas shouldn't be canceled and that other people's joy doesn't bring my eh, sadness to a worse place. I'm happy that other people are happy and it's not their problem that I'm not happy or I don't have people. It's really mine. Charlie Brown gets to that point where he not only believes in his own misery, he thinks that somehow he'll be happier if no one else is happy. That's kind of a different take on it. I guess in the end, that's why I liked or thought Charlie Brown Christmas is so unique because most children's Christmas stories are The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, all wonderful shows. But they're all happy. They might have like a moment of challenge with the bumble or some bit of sadness or the toys that couldn't find a home. And they get resolved. But this starts out very sad and depressed. And while it's a bit of a unique take, I think it understands that not everybody has a happy Christmas. And the whole point of the show is how can we get there? How can we get to the place? where we have a happy Christmas. And even as an atheist, it struck me as this was a unique message among all the Christmas stories. And then Linus says, of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. Here's a really weird, quick story. My friend and I were bored one day and this friend was a troublemaker. She always got us into trouble. And so one day she had us going through phone books, of all things, and calling famous people. We called like minor stars because they figure major stars don't answer their own phone, but minor stars on television shows and talk to them. So weird. But then she got the idea to call Charlie Brown, who happens to live in Chicago. Well, as it turns out, Charlie Brown was the head of AT&T. And as you can guess, we got in trouble. No more calling Charlie Brown. So on Lucy's recommendation, Charlie Brown was invited by Lucy to become the director of the Christmas pageant, which usually means a Christmas play. When Charlie Brown gets there, all the kids are just doing their own thing. They're all dancing in the way they want to do it, not in sync. They're not playing Christmas music. Each kid's just doing their own happy thing. I always think about how people will go to Christmas parties, you know, or Things that are very joyful, but again, don't have anything to do with the true meaning of Christmas. Everyone makes Christmas into their own thing, even if it's dancing, even if it's music, even if it's not commercial. We've all become a culture of doing your own thing. I don't know if that's what Charles Schultz was trying to get to, but that was kind of the message. So Lucy starts handing out the script. The girl with the red hair is vain, of course. She always is story of Charles Schultz is at one point he was married to someone that people suspected was a lot like Lucy. And later in his life, even after the divorce, he made Lucy a little bit nicer. I think he eventually did marry the girl with the red hair. Linus is given a script and he struggles to memorize the script. But Lucy gives him five good reasons, all the fingers of her fist, for him to do so. And then Lucy, of course, is the Christmas queen. She wants to be beautiful and powerful, and she took the best spot for herself, very Lucy. And the kids, they still want to screw around even after they get their scripts and they know their roles. They're dancing again, not to Christmas music, not to any sort of pattern. They're just all doing their own thing. And then Lucy says, you know, it's all a racket, Christmas may indicates that it's run by some sort of Eastern mob. So Charlie Brown thinks that maybe if he gets the appropriate Christmas tree, it'll put everyone in the right Christmas spirit. Lucy, she wants a pink tree. Pink aluminum tree? I remember the aluminum trees, and they were actually kind of pretty in some way, but very tacky. And of course, not anything natural or representing the evergreen which was to represent eternal life in Christ, since evergreens never go brown. So Charlie Brown goes to the Christmas tree park. You know, we, we've seen those in parking lots and in areas where there's all sorts of Christmas trees stacked up one after another. And you can either go back into the woods and cut down your own tree or pick one of the trees that have been cut down already and bind it up in 
kind of a mesh and put it on top of your car. And in this Christmas tree park, they're all fake. They're pink, they're purple, they're blue. I mean, it's pretty for sure. It's pretty interesting too that you would have an outdoor Christmas tree park. But Charlie Brown finds the one real tree left. To him, it speaks to him. And Linus says that that tree doesn't fit, quote, the modern spirit. So they go back and show the kids while they're waiting for Charlie Brown to come back with the tree. Schroeder is playing Beethoven's Fifth. Not very Christmassy. And then when Lucy complains, he goes back to jazz. And then he kind of switches back and forth between them. And then at some point, he starts trying to please her because she asked for jingle bells. Well, I guess it's close to Christmas. And she doesn't like the styles. He tries it in piano mode. He tries it even in organ mode. And then eventually gets to tinkle music. And then that's what she wanted. But what's interesting is that Schroeder will play anything but Christmas music. And if he does play Christmas music, it is the secular Christmas music. He's not at all interested in playing Christmas music that's tradition. And Lucy says that she wants Santa Claus and Ho 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 and Christmas for pretty girls. So she's caught up in the Santa Claus part of things. It's interesting because that's really the only place with Sally writing a letter to Santa and Lucy talking about Santa and Ho 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 that Santa enters this Christmas story. So Charlie Brown comes back with the tree and everyone calls it terrible. Someone says it was a poor tree. They don't even like it. Everyone laughs at him, including his own dog. I mean, how do you get laughed at by your own dog? And Charlie Brown screams, does anyone know what Christmas is really about? And at this point, this is where Linus starts reciting Luke and the nativity scene. The interesting thing about the nativity scene in Luke is there are a lot of different stories in Matthew. We have history. We have aspects of it. But Luke is that charming nativity scene we think of when we're thinking of Christmas cards or that warm feeling. So he recites that passage in Luke. For a kid who says he has no ability to memorize a script, he sure did great on Luke. That makes Charlie Brown feel a little bit better. And then he walks home. He's going to decorate the tree and he's going to show everyone how good this tree could be and not to drive too deep of a point in it. But I mean, that's it. For those of us who celebrate traditional Christmas, who think of cr Christmas in traditional ways, we want that traditional thing to have as much sparkle and as much magic as all the different things that everyone is making the fancy Christmas lights, the big commercialism, the cars with the bows on them. We want our traditional Christmas to be that sparkly. And in this case, he puts a single ornament on it and the whole tree just flops over. Not very good. He even laments that Snoopy, who won the first prize in the Christmas decoration, that Christmas has gone commercial. But you know what? He has some resilience. He's going to carry on with his traditional Christmas. And when the kids see how sad Charlie Brown is, Linus says, it's not such a bad tree after all. Takes his favorite blanket. We know how much Linus loves his blanket. and puts it around the base of the tree, making it stand up tall. Then they take all the decorations off of Snoopy's house and put it on the tree, making it look like a tiny but beautiful tree. Then they all sing, hark the herald angels sing, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. They all hum it at first, and then sing. That's the end of the movie. We end with everyone finding the true meaning of Christmas in a peaceful winter scene. And so I think in the end that that's what it's about, that all the ways of modern world, which really started in the mid-60s, was to tear down things that were traditional, make things better. We can make everything better. And that's where Christmas got commercial, where Kind of the worship of wintertime became big, not worship in the true sense of it. I get the idealized winter or Sally with her gifts and Santa or Lucy and her wanting to be beautiful, powerful and have real estate. Schroeder and his not even noticing it's Christmas time. He just wants to keep playing Beethoven. Snoopy with his commercialism, his treats. And really not caring about anything. Snoopy is always Snoopy wherever he goes. Nothing ever flaps him. The girl with red hair wanting to be vain. 
In the end, it's easy for all of us to lose the true meaning of Christmas, for us to go down one of these pathways, which we remember in Luke 2.7. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and said, Glory to God. And the glory of God shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. That is the message of Jesus and how he came to save us all. Charles Schultz, of course, wrote Charlie Brown, and he started out in the church. He built a lot of faith and a lot of faith issues into Peanuts throughout all the time. I used to check out comic strip books from the library and read all the Peanut comic books before I was born that were older or because we didn't even have a newspaper when I was a kid. He grew up in Minnesota, and he professed his faith in Jesus. He was very committed to his faith. He was a deacon. He did Bible studies and often did preaching, even doing some street evangelism, they say. There's a whole book written about it called Charlie Brown Religion. Talks a lot about Charles Schultz. He later moved to California and became an active Sunday school teacher. He had a falling out in his marriage. Things weren't going very well. And towards the end of his life, he described himself as a secular humanist. Does that mean he didn't believe in Jesus anymore? Or did it mean that he didn't believe in the church anymore? No one really knows. But we can see that the orthodox or tradition that he grew up with no longer seemed to be a part of his life. The one thing that Charles Schultz did back in 1965, was make the show, make the Charlie Brown Christmas. He wanted the message of faith in there. The CBS execs didn't really think much of the show. They didn't like the blatant message. They didn't like the jazz music. They thought there should be a laugh track, which would been weird. By the time the show was ready to go, it was too late to cancel. They had sponsors, which was Coca-Cola, and it aired on December 9th, 1965, for the first time. Obviously, as a kid, I saw it in reruns, year after year. When I saw that Apple was going to buy Peanuts, and then that also included the Charlie Brown Christmas, I wondered if they would keep the religious aspects in the show. I mean, there's all sorts of Christmas shows, and only one, one out of all of them that have anything to do with Jesus, when it's, in fact, Jesus's holiday. But that was, again, because Charles Schultz stuck by it. And in the end, the show got Great ratings, and it is still one of the most loved holiday shows still to this day. But as an atheist, it always struck me how this message of Jesus always came through. And I think even people who are looking at Christmas as a secular item, I think still hope in their heart that it has meaning beyond gift giving and beyond just the commercialism of Christmas. Originally, this story came from the producer, Lee Mendelson, who was part of CBS and told Charles Schultz that he and his wife had celebrated Christmas by reading Hans Christian Andersen's The Fir Tree. And then Charles Schultz took it and told the story of Charlie Brown, his sad feelings, and the Christmas trees, the aluminum fake ones and the real ones. So my challenge to you is, can you take a look at your own Christmas celebration? coming up soon and see if there's a way you can bring your own Christmas back in to that gospel message of Luke, bringing our focus back to what really matters, the simplicity, the meaningfulness of what it is to have Jesus in a manger. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please have a very Merry Christmas. Take time with the people who matter. Take time with our Savior, who went into a manger, which was a feeding trough, experienced everything that humans can experience, also that we could be saved. 
please focus on the Christmas message that means the most. And remember, our walk to visit Jesus in the manger starts with small steps. <music>